Well, thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure uh, uh, to be here. Uh, the uh, subject of my talk is inequality and sustainability, uh, and uh, I'm going to uh, uh, focus a lot of my discussion on, on you might say, politics, uh, because the uh, uh, major event uh, that's happening around the world today, obviously, is Trump. Uh, uh, Trump has uh, thrown a hand grenade into the political, uh, into the global economic order. Uh, the United States uh, helped create uh, this rules-based uh, system that I believe has brought uh, uh, enormous peace, stability, uh, and prosperity to the world. And uh, now uh, he uh, hopes to totally undermine it. And I think uh, as you look, as one looks at what is going on in the United States and in uh, many other countries, uh, I think there's a key lesson. Um, excessive inequality uh, undermines political, social, and economic sustainability. Uh, so what I want to do uh, this afternoon is describe what has been happening uh, in inequality. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, uh, the numbers are going to be drawn disproportionately from the United States. We, we have the best uh, data, and uh, the United States uh, does things bigger and better than other countries, including creating more inequality than any other country. And there's an important lesson from that. Those who aspire to follow in the American model will wind up with a lot of inequality, which is not sustainable. Um, I'm going to try to then very briefly to give my interpretation of what, uh, why uh, things have turned out so badly in the United States and uh, then go on finally to talk about uh, why uh, this is likely, why this is undermining sustainability of our entire system. Uh, I'm going to be, as I say, focusing mostly about inequality and economic, political and social sustainability. But I, I, I want to echo uh, the paramount importance of environmental sustainability. And um, what is going on in the United States demonstrates how all these are so closely linked. Um, because we've had uh, this uh, excessive levels of inequality, uh, we uh, uh, have uh, elected a, a, a president uh, I should remind everyone you know, that he got many fewer votes than Hillary Clinton and that he got actually fewer votes than the losing candidate in the previous election. But uh, the fact that people didn't vote is itself a, 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 a sense of alienation uh, from the system. But uh, he... Uh, does represent, uh, or, and, and that politics represents a threat to environmental sustainability. Global warming is a global problem, and uh, even if the United States has moved from number one polluter to the second, uh, it is still number one on per capita basis. And I don't, I mean, I'm not bragging about this, but uh, it is uh, the reality, and uh, for uh, the United States to be headed by a climate denier, uh, a climate change denier, is uh, deeply troubling and um, the, it represents, uh, you know, what's happened is when you have coal miners without jobs and no prospect, uh, he can promise them jobs. Talks about clean coal, but that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as clean coal. Uh, and, um, uh, it's a you know a, a two-way uh, 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 direction. Bad environment actually does contribute to more inequality. It is the poor that are most adversely affected, and so it it exacerbates inequality. But inequality uh, in turn leads to the election of people like Trump, who are uh, uh, advocating uh, environmentally unsustainable policies. 
So, uh, as I say, I, because I'm not going to be talking about it, I do want to put it up front that it is really a core to, to what we're uh, uh, talking about. The one thing that can't be changed, uh, I'm going to say that we can change uh, our uh, rules, uh, our economic rules, our policies. The one thing we can't change is the planet. Uh, we don't have a choice of another planet. And uh, we can change the laws of physics. Um, the, uh, I think he would like to. Uh, there was one state in the United States that decided that it was too complicated for students to learn that pi was equal to 3.1416 dot, dot, dot. And so they passed a law in that state that pi would be only 3.14. Now. <laughs> You can't do that. Uh, you can't change the laws of physics. And so that's the one immutable that we have to live with. Mm -hmm. And so we have to adapt the rest of our system to uh, these laws of physics. So let me describe very, very briefly how bad things are in the United States. And I'll make some remarks about uh, 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 what's happening in Europe and, uh, and in Italy. Uh, if you look at data for the United States going back more than 40 years, you look at the average income of the bottom 90% uh, on a graph, uh, it looks essentially flat. Uh, it takes a microscope to see uh, any improvement. That's remarkable. You know, we talk about the wonders of the market economy. For the bottom 90%, their average income has been basically stagnant for more than uh, four decades. Almost all the growth, uh, I mean all the growth essentially, has gone to the top 10%. And um, uh, much of that has gone to the top 1%, to the top 1 tenth uh, of 1%. And um, while Europe has done a little better, it's really very little better. That same pattern is evident, the, the top 10% and top 1% haven't done quite as well. M my friends in the top 1% are struggling to, to do as well, which means to push down the rest, but, but uh, um, that it is not a, a good picture. Um, and uh, you might say uh, one of the good things, uh, one of the things about Italy is it, it is done better than most of the other European uh, countries. Uh, in, in terms of this, these statistics, but some of the others I'll talk about later, uh, it has not d done so well. Um, in a way, uh, illustrative of, how, of what's been happening is CEO pay, and that illustrates that what's going on is not justified by the standard economic theories of margin and productivity, those of you who studied economics in school probably had to suffer through that and it was a, a, an idea that originated 200 years ago to try to justify the inequalities. Uh, and uh, there were two theories going around, one saying that the inequalities were going on were based on exploitation and the other was w that the theory that the inequalities were associated with differences in social contribution. Uh, the latter theory, I think, has really been uh, totally undermined in the last decade. Uh, the, the single event that made that clearest was the uh, global financial crisis where the bankers who brought the world to the brink of ruin, uh, whose social contribution was unambiguously negative, and yet they walked off with bonuses in the uh, tens of millions, aggregate in billions of dollars. So anybody that says, you know, they were just being rewarded for their social contribution, uh, that's nonsense. Um, more broadly, um, what's happened in the United States uh, in the last 35 years is that CEO pay has gone from 10, 20 times that of average workers, a very uh, large number, to 300 to, uh, times as large, without any evidence of higher productivity. 
no evidence, and I mean, I'm sure you'll agree with uh, your, any uh, of the business leaders uh, here, uh, no reason, no evidence that American business leaders are 10 times as productive as European business leaders. Uh, and yet, uh, American business leaders, as say, get 300 times the, the wages of their workers. A, a standard story you hear in places you know, in, in the United States and others is uh, a, a variant of some variant of trickle-down economics uh, that don't worry about this, this is the politics of envy. Um, in fact, everybody benefits by giving so much money to the top. And sometimes I say, I wish it were true that there was this kind of trickle-down economics because we've thrown so much money at the top that if trickle-down economics were true, everybody in our society would be well off. Uh, but it's not true. And um, the clearest evidence is that in the United States, um, the median income uh, today is uh, uh, roughly the same as it was a quarter century ago. Uh, median is half above, uh, half below. Uh, but more telling and more reflective of the anger that you saw in the election, any of you went and saw those, the, the primary uh, in the Republican Party, you, you, you saw the, the, the anger that was uh, so evident there, is uh, the median income of a full-time male worker uh, is roughly today in the United States at the level that it was more than 40 years ago. And that's for a full-time male, full-time worker, and a very large fraction of, the, uh, of these males in their 50s, 40s, cannot get a full-time job. So if you look, if you include that, it's much lower. Um, so in a way, you know, they were told that every generation was going to be better than the last, and that there was upward mobility, things were going better, and now you've had two generations of stagnation. Uh, at the bottom, uh, things are worse. Uh, the real hourly compensation, for instance, uh, at the bottom in the United States, adjusted for inflation, is uh, at the same level that it was 60 years ago. And you know, when I talk, give this kind of talk in China, they look at disbelief because you know, 40 years ago, per capita income was about $150. And, you know, the whole rise of China, and they say, "You mean to tell tell me that the level at the bottom is the same as it was before? You know, we began this change." They they find it incredible, uh, but it's true. And. Uh, in terms of what's been happening in Europe, uh, uh, it's uh, hard to get consistent uh, data for long periods of time. But the basic facts is that over the period that we have da data, a little over a decade, uh, uh, incomes, median income has been stagnant. And in fact, today in Italy, uh, real income, median income adjusted for inflation is, is lower uh, than it was a decade ago. So um, the, the numbers uh, are not uh, that, uh, uh, are, are better than the United States, but nothing, nothing uh, 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 to be proud of. Um, the um, bottom line of all this is that an economic system that is not delivering for very large fractions of the population is obviously not going to be sustainable. And uh, you know, you, you talk about the wonders of the market economy, you hear that from a lot of people in that 1%, and they have reason to talk about the wonders. But uh, it's not working for, and in the case of the United States, <clears throat> the vast majority of our citizens. Now, there are multiple aspects of inequality and, um, you know, uh, uh, in multiple uh, dimensions. Uh, we still have uh, gender inequality that you talked about. We still have racial inequality. Um, uh, we have inequalities in access to justice. 
we have inequalities in voice and in the ability, you know, when, when I was chief economist at World Bank, um, we uh, did a survey of 10,000 people, what was the aspect of poverty that they cared about most, and obviously income was one, insecurity was another, and lack of voice in the things that affected their lives was the third. And uh, those are evident. And one of the reasons why voter turnout is so low is a feeling that it doesn't make any difference. Um, we had an election in 2008, and a change, a promise a change, change you could believe in, and yet the policies seem to be the same pro-bank policies that we had before. And uh, as the economy recovered from the recession, um, uh, the head of the Federal Reserve and the president would talk about recovery. In the first three years of our recovery, 91% of the growth went to the top 1%. So they believed that they were being lied to or the system was totally uh, distorted. Uh, you know, I so said there was a recovery and for 90, for, for the vast majority of Americans, bottom 99%, there was no recovery. So they didn't, led to a distrust of the political process and uh, 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 a, a, a uh, deep feeling that the system was unfair. Uh, in the United States, I, I think in many other countries, as I say, there, there is a real problem of access to justice, and I, I want to emphasize that. You know, the United States has 5% of the world's population, 25% of the world's prisoners. We've had a pro process of mass incarceration, and it is uh, overwhelmingly aimed at African Americans. And so, again, a real perception, reality, that the system uh, is, not, uh, is not fair. Uh, the wealth inequalities are greater than the income inequalities. Um, there are eight Americans who made one critical decision. They're from two families. Uh, that one important decision, and that I tell my students is the critical decision uh, you have in your life, which is choosing the right parents. And, uh, so they, uh, these eight Americans, uh, uh, six from the Walton family, two the Koch brothers, uh, have as much wealth as uh, the bottom 44% of the country. And these statistics uh, that I'm talking about are reflected at the global scale. Uh, at Davos uh, every year, uh, Oxfam uh, does a, 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 a really, uh, uh, important report on inequality. And they've been doing this for a number of years now. And when they first started doing the report back in 2014, the question was, how big of a bus did you need to have as much wealth as the bottom 50% of the world? In other words, how big of a bus did you have to have to have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people? And uh, in 2014, the number was 85. And uh, today, the world has gotten more efficient in delivering inequality. And so you don't need a bus anymore. It's a minivan. Eight men, they're all men, have as much wealth as the bottom 3.5 billion people. So um, the, some of the trends that I've described us are, are uh, also evident uh, in uh, globally. Um, there's one more aspect, I mean, I could go on, but there's one more aspect that I think is worth noting um, because it, it, it is uh, so clearly a result of the fact that the United States is the only country that does not recognize access to healthcare as a basic human right. And uh, I mention that in part because some of the things that the Troika is doing in some parts of Europe 
are moving Europe in the same direction. What they've done to the healthcare system in Greece is a crime against humanity. Uh, but I want to describe the numbers for the United States because some of you may have missed this. And these are numbers that came out of a study that was done by Ann Case and uh, Angus Deaton. Angus Deaton got the Nobel Prize in 2015. And uh, what they look at is uh, the mortality rate, the probability of death, or you can think of this simply as the life expectancy. Uh, the life expectancy of uh, males, white males, because we're, the, people said, well, you know, we've had a racial divide, but the, the healthier group has been whites. The life expectancy of white males who are not, who have only gone to high school, not gone on to college, has been declining. Uh, and it's been declining very rapidly in every age cohort. And um, it's the kind of, of decline in health status that the only time I've ever seen anything like it was when I was chief economist of the World Bank and we looked at what was happening in Russia after the collapse of the, iron, you know, the Soviet system. Things weren't going very well. Our data said that income was down by 30%, but we didn't, weren't sure. We couldn't believe things were that bad. But when we got demographic data showing that life expectancy was down by two years for males, we knew something was wrong. But that's what's been happening in the United States. The decline in this group is so large and so significant that the average life expectancy of the United States for the whole is in decline. This in an advanced country so-called, uh, uh, that life expectancy uh, is in decline. And it's because of, not that there's a disease going around, it's not like there's uh, an AIDS epidemic or a, a virus that's going around. It's mostly uh, despair. It's alcoholism, suicide, drug overdose, those are the things that are leading to the decline in life expectancy in the United States. So those are symptoms of something very wrong in our society. And to come back to the theme that, uh, of, of today, uh, this is a system I believe that is not uh, sustainable. So uh, what is the reason uh, that uh, there have been these dramatic results. Well, it's not the laws of nature. Uh, it's something to do with changes in technology, which sometimes called skill bias technical change. But that itself is in part a result of decisions that governments have taken and our societies have taken. If you were at, you know, in the United States, we are, we're, uh, and in Europe you see all over the place, um, uh, machines replacing unskilled workers. Innovation, creative innovation in areas where we don't need it. We don't need more unskilled labor unemployment. But if you think about what has gone on, you can understand it. The Federal Reserve has lowered the interest rate to zero. But we haven't lowered wages to zero yet. We're trying. But that means what is the scarce factor? If the cost of capital is zero, you don't care about the cost of a machine. So even though the, the um, uh, labor is not very expensive, capital is even less expensive. And we've done that because of the way we've conducted monetary policy. And we've made it, we provided incentives for firms to innovate, to create more unskilled labor. What should they be doing? What is the scarce factor in our society? It's absolutely clear. It's the environment. That's the one thing that we can't, you know, we, we, we can't uh, 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 get around. But that's not where they're doing innovation. 
the big bake breakthrough in terms of solar panel, where did that occur? In China. Why did it occur in China? Because they decided it was important to have solar panels. Don't we have researchers that could have made those breakthroughs? Of course we do. But they were working hard on figuring out how to make more unskilled labor unemployment. And they've succeeded. So, um, um, uh, it's, uh, what is, what is uh, uh, going on? What you see is, as you look across countries, you see huge differences in the level of inequality. The laws of economics are the same in, on both sides of the Atlantic, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, you know, demand and supply, all that. The laws of technology are the same. Why is there such differences in the levels of inequality? Well, it's because of the policies that governments uh, have put in place. And those have resulted in these marked differences uh, in inequality. Uh, those differences in inequality are related to and also cause differences in opportunity. And uh, that is one of the most disturbing aspects. You know, America thinks of itself as the land of opportunity. And uh, everybody knows somebody that made it from the bottom to the top, and newspapers write about it. But why do newspapers write about it? Because it's unusual. <laughs> newspapers don't write about dogs that bite humans, but when a human bites a dog, they do write about it. Uh, and uh, so is upward mobility. Uh, this is one of the areas where the data for Italy is not so good. Um, there are three countries where the level of equality of opportunity is markedly lower than in other advanced countries, US, UK, and Italy. Um, at the other extreme, the countries in Northern Europe, uh, Scandinavian countries, and what we call Scandinavian North America, that is Canada, uh, all have low levels of inequality and high levels of equality of opportunity. Well, um, I want to, uh, as I say, uh, uh, emphasize it is the way we've, we've uh, written the rules of, of the economy. And about a third of a century ago, uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, there began a process of rewriting the rules of the market economy. Markets don't exist in a vacuum. They have to be structured, and they're structured by the laws or legal frameworks. And uh, across the board, there was a restructuring of the laws, a rewriting of the laws, that led to this increase in inequality and a slowing of economic growth. And the links are very clear. One of the things that happened was a change in corporate governance as a, one example that led to more short-termism, uh, an increase in the roles of financial markets that led to excessive financial financialization of the economy. So uh, all of this uh, has led to uh, uh, this, uh, the, this huge increase in inequality. So let me get, then finally, uh, uh, talk about why this leads to uh, uh, problems of uh, lack of sustainability in all its dimensions. Um, the economic, uh, the lack of economic sustainability is evident. Uh, the 2008 crisis is an example. Um, slow growth that marked the period after the crisis is an example. And the reason for that is that those at the bottom consume less than those, uh, the, the, save less than those at the top. And so when you redistribute income towards the top, aggregate demand goes down and that leads to uh, 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 demand constraints. And uh, we call it Keynesian problems, a lack of uh, a, a demand. And that is what uh, has been happening. It also affects productivity, though. If you have a high level of inequality of opportunity, it means that 
those at the bottom who didn't uh, have the right parents, those at the bottom aren't able to live up to their full potential. And you're wasting your most valuable resource, your human resource. Uh, re resource. So uh, it's, it's obviously a, a moral issue and it's an issue about human dignity, but it's also an economic issue that it leads to uh, more unst greater instability and lower growth. And that's a view not only, you might say, of traditionally of, of the left, but even now the IMF, and all of you know the IMF is not a left, leftist uh, secret organization. It is, uh, uh, they've put this at the center of their economic uh, agenda. Uh, the, uh, but I began by talking about Trump, uh, and the fact is, the, probably the most uh, disturbing aspect of it is that it leads to uh, political unsustainability. That uh, we live in democracies, and on both sides of the Atlantic, there's a perception of a democratic deficit. Um, that uh, people who felt that they worked hard, played by the rules, uh, have not done very well. The data that I gave before exemplifies that. Uh, the, um, and the result of that is they believe the system is rigged, unfair, uh, and government can't be trusted uh, to do it. In a way, many people don't really expect government to solve the problem, but they expect government to have the heart, its heart in the right place. And uh, their view, I think, uh, is that's not where its heart is especially in the United States where money drives politics, it's very clear where people, where politicians spend their time. Fundraising. The last election cost more than a billion dollars for each side. And it's not very fun for, for, you know, for our senators and representatives because uh, many of them want to be engaged in policy making, but most of their time is involved in fundraising. But if you're engaged in fundraising, you have to go to where the money is. And therefore, they spend a lot of time with the bankers and with the 1%. And the suspicion is that that time leads them to, to uh, identify with those people. The striking thing about Trump is that while he seemed to make a plea for that particular uh, uh, group, uh, you know, the reality is that he, it, his heart is with the billionaires. Uh, he feels most comfortable with them. But he doesn't even believe in transparency. So the first time, he is not going to allow public disclosure of who is visiting the White House. That's been a minimal sense, you know, you don't know what they say, but at least we had a disclosure of who was talking. And uh, he said, no, I don't like that kind of disclosure. Well, um, the, uh, uh, the consequences, I think, are pretty evident. The dangers of, are pretty evident. Uh, that if you wind up with this kind of, of uh, uh, outcomes, you aren't going to get uh, uh, a uh, democratic sustainability of our economic system. So to me, uh, the alternative economic frameworks uh, are easy, you know, easy to tell, write down what we should do to get a more equal society. I think it would be a uh, a greater, a well, better performing society. I think Europe has a more difficult time, uh, and when I say that is that the reforms that are needed are really reforms in the structure of the EU and even more in the Eurozone. So the hands of each country, like Italy, are, I think, tied in many areas. And so uh, uh, what you can do there are things you can do, but the most important thing is to change the rules of the EU and the Eurozone. 
because uh, there are big advantages of, of, of that kind of economic integration. But if you have economic integration with the wrong rules and you tie your hands, then you're tying your hands to an economic system that would deliver low growth and divergence both within countries and between countries. And that's exactly what's been happening now uh, for more than a decade. So uh, that's the challenge uh, here. And uh, I think, it's, it, it, let me just say, uh, as an American, uh, I think uh, it's really important that you solve that. <laughs> because uh, Europe has been the really the, the stronghold of uh, human rights, the stronghold of, of awareness of the importance of sustainability in all its dimensions, including environmental sustainability. And so if the voice of Europe isn't heard, uh, the risk for our world uh, is increased enormously. Thank you.